Boston is full of great literary arts, academics, authors, and artists. But we also know that we have a comprehensive network of human services and creative communities. But those are our strengths. One of the things that I think many of you are also aware of is that we have deficits as well as strengths. And there's a disconnect between some of those strengths and some of those deficits. There are a lot of invisible walls in our communities. And what we aim to do is try and make connections between these siloed worlds. Our mission at Writers Without Margins is to move between these worlds and to try and make real meaningful connections. One of the things I learned in my previous career in law was the power of solidarity and silence breaking. And one of the things I've witnessed among writers is the healing strength or authority, authority, authors, <laughs> and what they can do and what can come from writing. There is decades of data and research on this, but those of you who write already know what I'm talking about without science. It's about the process of providing form and structure where only chaos has existed before. It's about re-seeing or revisioning reality. It's about reclaiming the narrative that is your life story. It's about the fusion of art and advocacy, and that's what we're after. So this is the part of the night where I stop talking, and because it's important for me to turn over the program and to let you all experience and witness what you've come here for, or as we say in writing workshops, to show and not tell. And with that, I want to introduce you to our first reader, Mathematics Millionaire X. Diction says, in my mother's womb was the greatest love. The nine letters in addiction means I was hooked on drugs. Hustlers chase, hustlers chase Gucci that brings groupie love. Prison is filled with violence, hate, gangs, and thugs. At the end of the day, everyone wants God's supreme love. Five times a day, Muslims pray on rugs. Forty dollars buys an attic a fix. Get a boy set at best. Our minds play tricks and become our worst enemy. A needle, cooker, and a crack pipe became best friends to me. Family love and support has always been there. The disease of addiction tells us that no one cares. An addict's biggest problem is addressing our fears, doing a drug to hide the, lack, the heart's lack of love and care. If Fernandez worked the 12 steps, I think he'd still be here. No matter the first, second, or third tier, the loss of hope and loneliness glooms in the air. There is a solution, it's called the spiritual path, given to others first and putting our ego last. For a dollar a day, cutting prison grass, thinking about the past and our future paths. Prison is where you end up if you want to be a clown in class. Tired of the cold cereal during the Muslim fast. T um, takes reading and self-care to make this time in prison our last. Acts of kindness have more value than jewelry and cash. Life is fast like a car, an addiction we crash. Mothers get the call that their son or daughter is past. Kids pour flowers at the gravesite in the grass. This is not a game. Ask the families who have the addict's ashes in a glass. And with that, thank you. <laughs> A star, a beam of light, a being of what's good in the world soaring through time, though she is young to the spare of fire, earth, water, and air. One sees a violent person, but she sees a soul tainted when still pure at heart. For life is a game, our years the many levels, the trials, the adventures, the choices, the game board of several paths. Hope fade, time slayed. Thou mighty howl of ancestral ascent, orbs of wisdom tainted with the paint of the sea. Looking into your soul, seeing what light resides, if you're awake or asleep. At last it goes as the present souls pay it no mind, letting yet another sliver of salvation slip by, 
Thou shalt never know my treasures I carry, nor the crimson torch I bear to my soul to guide you. All right, so my piece tonight that I'm reading is called What Writing Is. Do you experience intense feelings of doom? Overwhelming emotions, racing thoughts? If so, then you may be eligible to participate in a two-week study on anti-anxiety medication overseen by... The words are slight, sans serif, non-threatening, a dark gray font nearly indistinguishable from black, printed on an off-white banner placed carefully just above commuters' heads on the T. I glance back from the ad to the other passengers. They pack closely together, standing or sitting, either staring out the window or oscillating between their phone or book to the outside and back. A few sway with the car's gravity. I sway with them. The tea stops. We cluster to let more on. I feel bad for the woman who stood under my arm. I had showered, but I hadn't washed my shirt in a week. The car jolts on. We all watch the trees roll up behind concrete as we descend into Kenmore. Underground, the bee line sheds brownstone for a bright blackness. All you have to look at is your phone or the darkness outside the window which reflects your own image, or the ads. I hadn't seen this one before. I first noticed it when I got on in Alston, where, next to me, with me, pushing into the trolley, others held up their wallets and flashed their trolley cards, and I did the same, knowing full well I didn't have the fare if the driver were to ask me to come to the front. The ad continued. For participation, you may be eligible for cash compensation up to $300, up to. What made someone eligible for the full amount? To what would you need to agree? When I worked as a linguistic researcher at Virginia Tech, I took an IRB certification course, which forbade unethical practices, such as offering financial compensation that was undeniable. I make $11 an hour. My net pay comes to perhaps $400 biweekly, not including tips. The same year I earned IRB certification, a friend of mine at another university, studying in one of the country's top biomedical programs, called to ask my opinion about sperm donation. When I pressed him for a reason, he responded that it's more enjoyable than donating plasma. <laughs> the beeline ends at Park Street. It doesn't venture into the financial district. You won't see anyone wearing suits on the beeline unless they got on at Heinz, having taken from Harvard the number one bus. One. Superlative. Generative capital. The green line intersects at Park Street with the red line, which veins all the way from Alewife to Braintree. For 225, you could observe the creep of gentrification from north to south, east to west. Was this ad for me? Because it felt undeniable. $300 was grocery money for three months, or it was a fifth of one month's rent. I did not come to Boston impoverished. I came with savings. I came, I thought, ready for its challenges. But coming to Boston is like riding the beeline. You get on in Alston, riding through the gentrified grid of performative punk, and you feel empowered by a diversity which feels comfortable to a white Southern boy like you, because it's diversity in moderation. The Orthodox Jewish neighborhood and the Orthodox Russian butcher, the Korean barbecues and three Starbucks are all a type of familiarity which affords a comfortable participation in gentrification under another umbrella term, just getting by. I joke at work that I'm not wealthy enough to have ethics. I can't buy reusable bags. I moonlight in my head that I write a polemic about the microplastics found in oysters, op-eds for the Globe, which lead to a book deal at Knopf, a Penn Faulkner, eventually a National Book Award. At the same time, I imagine writing this piece. I also imagine eating the oyster, relishing the brine. I like to know my oysters were bottom feeders. But then the beeline slips out of Alston and into Boston past the theaters of BU, by the sanctuary of the MFA you were not accepted into, the ramen place you've wanted to try but can't afford, and then you descend into that lambent darkness. When the windows go dark, I won't lie, I look at the reflections of others. I see others glance above my head. They linger. I linger on them, how they turn their whole bodies away from the banner. I know they're also from Austin by how they linger, as if they're waiting for the change of stoplight to cross. After ending the call with my friend, who ultimately backed out of donating sperm, I looked up clinics nearby. One of them offered up to $1,000 a month for regular donations. Up to. A phrase that indicates potential, but with no promise of achieving it. 
It's the American dream in a word. It's also an idiom. What are you up to? Oh, just getting by. Lastly, it's an implication of collusion. Up to something. The suspicion of artifice, of subterfuge, of clever misdirection. The very slim, very same sleight of hand I used to design the linguistic research project. IRB protocol permitted outright equivocation to the participant so long as they were not harmed, and so long as the compensation was never undeniable. What is the threshold at which an offer becomes undeniable? At what price are we willing to sell our neurochemistry? What risks are we willing to incur? By advertising on the T to those who can afford Alston but suffer it, the ad suggests that those who can be bought are coming from Alston, from Roxbury, from Forest Hills, and that researchers know how to coerce them. Is that what research is? The practice of displacing your own curiosity on the bodies of others? A type of voyeurism that is hypothetically consensual? Another brand of gentrification? Pretending to look out the window to look back at those around you? I write down the number. At the bottom of the ad, in a crimson banner, Harvard Medical printed their seal, Veritas. Thank you. Um, I broke my glasses, so I had to print. Elijah. My poem is titled, If Only. If only we had stopped and listened, and listened, and learned, and learned, and empowered. But we didn't, did we? Instead, at the very bottom of a voided pit, Darkness seeped in to where restless pain rolls up to an ape octum range. And they continue to do damage on things we cannot speak of. To the law we bow down as the afflicted move forward into the re-addictive afflictedness. While we who have come into existence watch and wait, wait, and watch, and earn padded facts, harass, as the cycle of choice, or is it the choice of the cycle, runs in many different directions. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity um, to come here and be inspired by everything that I hear in terms of people. When I say people in recovery, we're all recovering from something, but some of the recovery is more visible than others. The first poem I'm going to read is entitled, No Windows, No Doors. I was viewing the McLeod Plantation in James Island, South Carolina online when I wrote this. Where people ate, slept, had sex, babies, and died. Four walls, a roof, an entryway, no windows, no doors. I felt closed in, one eye weeps, the other dry. A strong urge to vomit sadness and anger away. But I must honor the feelings, the endurance of real people toiling to make others rich. I want to stab at ghosts of slave masters who could be in my DNA. As property, the captors, the owners came for pleasure 
and by right, no windows, no doors. And the second uh, poem is entitled, Remember. Remember the women who dared to speak to be. Their stories and ours must be told again and again to break the grip of silence from without and within. We place our ears to the ground, listen to rhythms of nature and earth both our mothers, gathering strength from just below our navels, we stand shoulder to shoulder, then kneel to doula each other into new life. We women, we women of all colors, beliefs, we women of all nations. This one's by me. <laughs> In a similar fashion as Muhammad Ali, who proclaimed triumphantly in the boxing arena, I am the greatest. Another notable man, Barack Obama, first black American in history, is elected to the highest office of US president. Times lapsed. My story has evolved. My immensity among the scribes I humbly proclaim. Yet I implore you, don't count me out. I've erred. So have we all. Learning from mistakes is what life's about. Keenly aware on occasion, I'll be tense. It is then that my weakness becomes my strength. Behold, the character produced Valuable nuggets of wisdom implemented to facilitate the unfolding of the greatest story, which must not go untold. <laughs> Nobody ever likes a mockingbird by Adam Ferreira. Yes, sir. Real street shit. Don't say a word on what you seen or what you heard. Get your brains blown out on the curb, because nobody ever likes a mockingbird. Can I read the other? This one I don't like. <laughs> saw it in the dream. This is for real, saw it in the dream. Not sure what it all means. Imagine possibilities, all the lessons learned. Many people helped in return, willing to work hard to live out the vision seen. Images of battleships armed ready to engage. Out of balance scales with uneven weights, armed citizens marching towards city, towards city to take down iron gates, calluses on their hands. Tired, burning feet, nights losing sleep, whatever it means. They have a charge to keep. No more taking orders from the powers that be. They're not willing to settle for status quo, though they look on in fear, not knowing what to do. The people are determined to stand against every bleeping foe, running down Constitution Way, hoping to find freedom that ends the struggle today, hoping to reach the passage where contentions will be addressed between the government and the people. People who want to keep them in check. Thank you very much.
My soul, my skin, begun anew, sloughing every seven years, burn, then peel. Myself evolves, melding, dying, disquiet, life's desire. Fall, failing, my psyche is yearning, striving, strategic maneuvers, plots, planning. My soul's ending places, me, unable to cope, complete. Thanks. called Connections. I am the animal of your imagination. Think of your body as an animal, a soft and strong animal. Use your imagination to make yourself better. Let your loneliness be your landscape. You don't have to be perfect. Announce your despair to the rain. The world goes wild. The world goes on. It's a pl pleasure for me to be here tonight um, and be a part of this wonderful evening of, uh, of artistry and words. Uh, my poem is Whistler's Nocturne. Nocturne in blue and gold. Oh, the mysteries and wonder you do hold. Myriad gradations of midnight and indigo blue infused with the faintest hints of golden hue. Influenced perhaps by Turner and Hiroshogi, but with your own originality springing from Whistler's inimitable creativity. Old wooden bridge of Battersea, whose darkened lattice legs stretch across a Chelsea, between the Thames and even shores, in you is most eerily depicted. Surrounded by com constant comings and goings, the buzz of beehive-like maritime activity, now at the end of another busy day, a return of quiet and tranquility. Lights of the city and in the heavens pierce through the thickened night air. A single soul tends to his day's final efforts, twilight glimmering upon the crests of the river's lapping waves. O'er the scene high up in the sky, an atmospheric phenomena dense and hazy, hangs heavily upon invisible rods, like a sheer steel-gray scrim upon a stage. The perceptible mist of dirt and particles, result of early industry on land and sea, that once choked lungs and blinded eyes of London's inhabitants, though creating an ambiance, both an enigmatic and most romantic. Long gone may be this mechanized fog, but so too the charm hard to deny that, is al that it also produced, inspiring greatly writers, poets, and artists all. Little understood when first painted, so much ridicule, ridicule did you withstand from critics, populace, and most of all, Ruskin, fellow artist and arbiter of taste, so idolized and adored in his day. It was he who led the charge of insults, accusing poor Whistler in creating you of flinging upon the public's face a pot of paint. Proud Whistler, not surprisingly, was rankled, taking exception to the foul claims, leading to a suit against Ruskin for libel, won at last after lengthy testimony and debate of Whistler's craft and style, garnering the artist but a single farthing in the end for all his troubles. Financial ruin was thought his feet, till came to him a new commission. Off to Venice, he was sent post-haste a series of watercolors he to paint, leading him to newfound acclaim. He no longer to hang his head in shame. O oh, nocturne in blue and gold, painting which once so affronted and for many years remained unsold, now with pride in the Tate Britain do resign. 
you and other nocturnes equally mocked, today our most revered and prized, sealing talented whistler's fame and place in the pantheon among the greats. As is the beauty of a butterfly remarked, so too the genius of Whistler at last recognized, once released from the cocoon of misconceptions. Thank you very much. The first piece I'm going to read is called How to Be the Change. Um, I made this piece, it's found poetry. I did it while I was uh, facilitating the writer's group, which got me into writing at the Wyman Recovery Home. So this is How to Be the Change. No fear at all, back from the dead, not too fast, put up the barricades, breaking free from the cell, multiple complications. A brief history of the crisis is needed, knowing, not guessing. Safer than it was, but crises have a habit of recurring, slave to the algorithm. Fuel of the future, doing good, doing well, processing the progress, big is beautiful. Any questions? <laughs> This next piece is kind of long. Um, this is basically me briefly describing uh, my first 24 hours in state prison. Um, so let's get right into it. It's called, uh, imagine this first 24. About 9.30 p.m., August 27, 2014. I step down from the back of a cramped van, shackles clanging, taking small steps. I'm told to walk 25 feet or so through a door, down 20 to 30 steps. I try to balance myself with my hands stuck to my side, and I'm placed in a small room. The door is shut behind me. I need to go to the bathroom, but there's nowhere to go. Not sure how much later, I'm pulled out of the room. Brought to a metal bench, cuffs and shackles are finally removed, arms and legs are finally able to move freely, as freely as they're going to be able to move for the next two years or so. I'm then brought behind a three-foot wall and told to strip down naked. Open mouth, lift arms, lift points at my crotch, turn around, lift feet, squat and cough. I'm given a cheap pair of used green tops and bottoms, a white t-shirt, boxers, socks, and shoes that might as well be winter weight socks. I don't have to use the bathroom anymore, I'm too terrified. They put me back in that room. I'm pulled back out of the room again and brought to speak with a nurse about any health issues. I'm given a TB test and sent on to the next person who explains the rules and regulations and all this other nonsense that sounds crazy. And quickly I'm brought over to have my picture taken. I'm told to stand still, see a, mouth go running, a mouse go running across the floor and flash. It's obvious from the expression on my face in the picture, but the officer won't change it for me. I'm given an ID with this picture, my basic information, and the number W105067 which is pretty much how I'll be referenced for a while, and they put me back in that room. Back out of the room again, I'm given a laundry bag full of more used tops and bottoms, white t-shirts, boxes, socks, toiletries, a, bag, a pad of yellow paper, envelopes, and a pen that's impossible to write with. There's also a brown paper bag with warm milk, two stale cookies, an apple that might be two years old, and one slice of bologna on stale white bread. Next is a piece of paper with a copy of my ID in B2 written on it. Maybe 11 p.m. August 27, 2014. I'm brought to a barred metal door with the label B2 above it. The door's open, I walked in. Most of the lights are out, there's lots of yelling. But I can see three levels on the right and metal tables with chairs attached straight ahead. I hand my paper to a man and I'm told to go to number six. I walk over to number six, and after about five minutes, the door slowly slides open. I step in, it closes behind me. There's a bunk bed on my left, a metal toilet straight ahead, a metal desk with a broken chair on my right, and a small shelf with four hooks up high above it. I dump out the laundry bag and realize there's also a set of sheets that feel like paper 
and I put them on a slab of a mattress on the bottom bunk, which is labeled 6A. I make the bed to the best of my ability and a pillow out of the extra clothes I was given. I can't eat, so I lie down and try to sleep. I stare at the ceiling and listen to the yelling. 7 a.m., August 28, 2014. I found out that time later. All the doors start opening, but number six stays closed. A couple of guys in the unit ask the person in charge to open my door for me. Ten minutes later, it's finally realized that the person in charge last night didn't mark that number six was now occupied and the doors opened. About 10 to 15 other guys ask me where I'm from, not caring what my name is, and one guy tells me it's about to be chow time. I watch on as everyone else basically stands behind the yellow line, waiting to be called. Chow is yelled, and the door of B2 is open. Everyone files out to the hallway through the metal detector and down to the chow hall. Breakfast is dry cereal, a piece of cake, and two barely cold cartons of milk. I sit by myself, I don't know a single person. I barely eat, hand my tray to a man at the back of the chow hall, and walk back to B2. I see other men checking the paper with names and numbers on it, so I find my name on the list and a number. With orientation, 10 a.m. written next to it. Another 10 or so guys asking where I'm from, and I hear 10 o'clock movement announced. I leave B2 to go to the auditorium for orientation. They tell us to sit in every other seat, and we watch two videos. One about the facility, one about prison rape. That's where it ends. what the mind wants versus what the heart wants. The mind wants luxurious vacations to unheard of islands transported via private jets with pilots and staff on standby, ready to cater to your every need. It wants fast cars to speed aimlessly along the Pacific Coast Highway, after which you settle into a well-known popular steakhouse where everyone knows you by name. It wants to sip wine amongst the wild roses and the sounds of nature, gazing beyond the rolling hills into the splendor of the forest that appears to shiver from the morning's gentle breeze. It wants infinite years to roam the earth without the debilitating fear of death, without reality there to prevent it from happening. The heart only wants to wake up in the morning to children laughing and playing with smeared ketchup still on their faces from that morning's omelet. It wants to remember the beaming smiles and e eager movements as the kids rip open their presents from Santa Claus on Christmas morning. It wants to embrace the love of your life and reminisce as the crickets chirp underneath a star-filled sky. Most of all, it wants to know that the, that the time, sweat, and tears spent were a small sacrifice for the family you love and the life you got to enjoy. I wrote, my journey with Writers Without Margins began two years ago in one of their creative writing workshops here in Boston. During that time, I took place in a video project which focused on the lives of workshop participants in hopes of ending stigmas and raising awareness of the struggles faced by many after incarceration. Going into this project, I had no idea what to expect. I figured we'd tell our stories, maybe meet some nice people, and possibly host an event or two. I had no idea that the next year and a half would be the most uplifting and empowering 18 months of my life. To fully understand what I mean, I urge you to watch the whole film once it's released, but I will say this much. My continued participation in this nonprofit and this video project is one of the most rewarding and gratifying aspects of my life today. The skills, guidance, support, and most importantly, the sense of self-worth that I've received from being a part of Writers Without Margins has been transformational and has had a profound impact on the person I am and the person I strive to become. 